Hello everybody, we are live on Isonation. Uh, thank you very much for, for tuning in. Um, we'll just let a few more people join the stream. And I'd like to welcome my guest today, who is Carolyn Pearson from Maiden Voyage. She's the CEO. And I've known Carolyn for um, about eight or nine years, I think it is now. Um, we worked on a couple of uh, campaigns together and, and events, which were, were great fun back mm -hmm. in my London, London days. Um, and I'm really excited that you've, that you've joined us. Because obviously your company um, specialises in helping organisations to safeguard their diverse travellers when it comes to corporate travel. So yes. this must be a um, particularly interesting time for you. So if you'd like to just elaborate a little bit more about Maiden Voyage and what it is that, that you offer normally, and then yeah. we can talk about the, the world that we're in now where we've been, where we're at, and potentially where we're going as well. So I'll hand over yeah, to sure. you. Thank you, Rachel. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And uh, just I want to say thank you also to you. What you're doing is very selfless, um, keeping us all you know, together and sane and inspired over these last few weeks. So thank you for making that happen. Oh, I know it's a lot of work. Um, but yeah, Maiden Voyage um, is my uh, indulgence, if you like. It's not just a job or a business. For me, it's the culmination of three of my absolute passions, which are the empowerment of other women, travel and technology, because my, my background was a tech corporate career. And so it's a dream to work in an industry where I can talk about travel, I can travel, I can inspire and mobilise other people to travel safely. Um, and also do that through a gender lens. So how that translates in products is that we provide um, travel safety training to all organizations. So some of the world's biggest corporations and small companies as well. And um, that might be through e-learning solutions or through on-site training. And if you imagine our, our trainers might be experts in kidnap hostage taking to humanitarians who've worked in some of the most challenging volatile uh, places on the planet so we really do cater for everybody in terms of travel safety whether it's a quick hop to new york or whether actually someone's going to afghanistan and then yeah. besides yeah. that we've also got a community so we have a, a community of ambassadors around the world who people can tap into to ask about that those local regions, is it safe? What's the dress codes for women? Is it safe for LGBT travellers? And then we've also got our community where people can actually chat and even arrange to, to meet up when they're travelling. So there's really, there's nothing not to like about what we do. Yes, and I love your passion, Carolyn. I mean, years ago when we did First Met, that really shone through, and here we are many years later, and it's still so exciting for you to be working with something that you absolutely love. Um, uh -huh. And initially, I really enjoyed the the female angle and and providing that travel safety for um, for corporate business travellers because often yeah. we do find ourselves you know alone either in the UK or abroad staying in, yeah. in hotels. And I like that you had um, the network of of women or you know safety tips or even just yourself and your team as the support to ask any questions whilst you were there or preparing your your journey because it also can be um a little bit lonely if you're if you're just staying for a couple of nights over in a hotel and you know it'd be nice to know of other other women that potentially are in the same position as you yeah and actually in our facebook community we've got um one of our members uh she's a, an international saleswoman and quite often she'll share you know a yoga studio that she's found in Oslo or a gym that she's found in Stockholm and so you know we can actually go to those places and she uh, her head office is based up here in Yorkshire so you know I promised to take her to our yoga studio as well so there's a lot of you know really practical health and well-being tips as well things to do when you when you're away when you don't want to be stuck in your hotel room doing emails yeah, definitely. And to find that sort of little community, even if it's just for, you know, one one or two days or if it's a longer trip, that can make your business journey so much more enjoyable and personable. Yeah. Um, I, I'm absolutely an advocate of a business trip, not just being about business, but also taking some time down in the evenings or, 
tagging a day on, a weekend on, and, and it's a horrible term, but the leisure um, industry, you know, blend of business and leisure. I don't think these days I ever do one or the other. Even if I go on holiday, I can't help maybe checking out a hotel for a maiden voyage. Oh, I love that. I haven't heard that term before, actually. Leisure, I like that, that blend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I've just been sharing our uh, our stream live on Facebook because obviously the more people that can join us and, and join in the conversation, the better. So if you are watching, please do like, share and comment and also feel free to ask Carolyn any, any questions about travel. Um, that would be lovely and I'll keep an eye on that stream as, as we're talking. Um, so what, what are you missing? You said earlier, I saw that you shared one of our isolation tweets that, that says that you're a, you're a bit of a travel junkie yourself. So actually, this time that we've been in lockdown must, must be particularly tricky for somebody like yourself that's used to gallivanting all over the yeah. place. Seriously, it's really, really tricky for me. I, I found myself going through an airport, I don't know, last year, and and I just thought to myself, you know, you look up at the screen, which has got all the different flights um, heading off somewhere. And it occurred to me that I only really feel normal when I'm in an airport. Um, that's my happy place because it's the anticipation, the excitement of going somewhere new. Um, you know, and some people get their dopamine hits from alcohol or dating or whatever it might be um and i'm not saying to the exclusion of all those things but for me i get my biggest hit from when i've booked a trip to you know coming home um and in fact if i feel down my my medicine if you like is to book a trip and so i always have a very healthy bucket list and so during covid of course a lot of us are struggling with mental health issues and my medicine genuinely is travel, even if it's just two or three days in London, and I'm not getting that. And so I've had to, you know, learn to adapt, but also start to think about, you know, what can I do from a staycation? How can I make a day trip feel like a, a trip rather than just, you know, I've just popped out for the day? Yeah. Oh, gosh. I feel for you. I feel for you. That's, such a, that's such a hard position to be in. I mean, I must admit, I'm probably the, the opposite at the moment um, and haven't been abroad for, for quite a few quite a few years, can you believe wow. it? Yeah. I lot when, I, when I was younger, but other things have, you know, I guess got in the way. But um, so that must be, you must have, lockdown for you must, must be pretty pretty tough then like you say what have you found other um activities or or things that have kind of helped sustain you at this at this time um so when boris announced the lockdown for me the only saving grace was that we were allowed to get out and exercise um and you know my one hour walks you know, full in disclosure, weren't always just an hour because for me, I needed to walk, I needed to be in the fresh air. The minute we were told that we could go to beaches, you know, I went to some isolated, deserted beaches. And so to be able to get out, um, I can't stand routine either. So I had to, you know, vary the walks. I need what we've, been, we've all been referring to as vitamin N for nature. So listening to birds, you know, of course, I, I meditate and I do yoga and I do exercise, but I just need to breathe. It's just to get out. Um, I don't really need so much restaurants, bars, even the foreign food. I miss the cultural aspect. So going anywhere where I hear different languages and, of course, being in Leeds, you hear a lot of different languages anyway. So just trying to pretend, if you like, that I'm somewhere different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So lovely, and I, I was always really keen that the government was really pushing that hour of exercise on everybody, yeah. and that people did seem to be making that a real priority while yeah. we were in, in this, you know, very restrictive um, situation. Thankfully, now we're in a different phase, and things are are easing. So, on to that, lots of people have been probably wondering about if their business trips would be happening again but also i guess their holiday trips as well lots of people sadly have had to cancel or have their holidays cancelled do you know what what the latest sort of um government guidelines are you've probably got a bit more insight than i have 
What's the latest on? Um, oh, actually, we've had some comments in here. Oh, cool. What's the latest on air bridges? Does anybody know? And hello to lots of people giving us a wave. Thank you. Actually, if you are a travel junkie and you're feeling my pain, please make yourself known. <laughs> Um, so in terms of holidays, well, let's get our priorities right because, you know, life is not worth living for me without holidays. So let's talk about them first. Um, you know, we, we are talking about possibly air bridges. And in fact, I just came off the, um, the phone today with uh, an airport. And so I'm assuming that the bulk of your audience, Rachel, are UK based. And so I can I'll talk from a UK perspective because every country is different. And that's the thing, it's a, it's a rapidly changing landscape and borders will continue to open and close as the, you know, we're basically tracking the virus. So if we have a second peak, I don't know even if you would call it a second peak in the UK, because we're just, you know, we've just got high numbers. And so it might just continue to be high, um, you know, then things will be opening and closing. So things to consider is, are you planning on going to a place that might be a bit precarious in terms of may they well close their borders and you get yourself stuck there? Um, in terms of air bridges, what will really help that is if the government um, reduces the 14 day uh, quarantine period, but also start to bring in thermo scanning at airports. So for example, last week I was speaking to the guys at Schiphol Airport and they've got the temperature guns. So literally you go through, you get a gun against your head. Um, and if you haven't got a temperature, then you can go through. If you have got a temperature, then you get diverted to uh, medical services. And so personally, although as I've said, you know, I'm someone who only feels normal when they're at an airport, I think our best bet really is to think about rocking the staycation in 2020 because there's so many you know cool lovely places in our own country that we've just not you know that we've not given attention to that um i predict that there's going to be an outstrip of um supply because of high demand this year yeah, yeah. at the moment i can tell you, i feel like i feel like i'm on holiday i am so hot today <laughs> of the year isn't it <laughs> and when the weather is lovely in the, in the UK then um, sometimes I think there is no better place to be no. um, but one one of the things that people are going to be thinking about obviously as as things do open up and and travel and indeed even if it is in the UK only is that safety yeah. in the places that they're going to definitely yeah. in terms of obviously hotel or B&B or whatever um, staycation it might be in terms of cleanliness and really feeling confident that they can trust the the, the teams um, that are running that are running these places and obviously everybody wants to do their best but there you know there may well be I guess margin for error so what what do you think are sort of the top priorities for these hotels and, and other travel businesses to make us the consumer or the corporate business traveler feel com confident and comfortable so i've actually spent quite a lot of time of course again not just only speaking to hotels but also speaking to um, a lady called Liz Smith Mill. She's she's a really interesting lady, and she's like the high priestess of um, hotel cleanliness. She she won Housekeeper of the Year. Who knew there was such a title? Um, wow. A few years ago at the um, the the Hotel Industry Awards, the the Katies. So she's very esteemed, and she's also worked for um, royal families, um, and you know gone and uh, advised their housekeeping teams on how to keep the palaces spick and span. So she really knows her stuff. Um, so at this stage, there is not one, there's certainly never going to be one global standard on hotel cleanliness. There are various organizations that are setting up, um, you know, with inspection standards. A lot of hotels also will outsource the housekeeping. And so there's also some standards that have got to be set, obviously, with those outsourced cleaning contractors as well. So it's things like proper, um, disinfecting, spraying um, with various products. Um, I'm no technical expert in the composition of those things, but a lot more cleaning. So in terms of what the guests will see, um, 
things like uh, contactless check-in. So is it by app? If they still have the old key cards, it'll be a new key card for every guest. They'll have the screens at reception. There'll be hand wash stations or uh, hand gel stations, limiting number of people in the lift to households, for example. Lower occupancy in the hotel so that guests can be spread around. There'll be no sort of buffet breakfast for the time being. Room service will probably be like a delivery. So maybe a knock on your door with a, a paper bag with things in there. Um, no non-essential housekeeping during your stay. Um, and now it, I know, Rachel, that you probably um, like the upper scale hotels rather than the budget. But actually what we're paying for in those hotels are the lush toiletries, the, you know, the extras. So a lot of hotels from an eco perspective have gone to the multi-use big bottles of toiletries. They'll have to go back to single use. Um, so that's a negative for the environment. But things like fluffy robes and slippers, cushions, throws, magazines, pens, pads, all non-essential will be stripped out. So you'll be going back to a very, very basic hotel product uh, for the time being. Um, so I would probably say save your money um, for the time being. Um, and obviously, all the hotels now are, are going to be on top of this. They're going to start publishing what their cleaning protocol is. Are they going to allow space of a few hours, 72 hours, some hotels are talking about between guests? So it's going to be a very sort of sanitary environment for the time being. But I think it just has to be. Um, and also things like swimming pools and spas, we can forget them for the time being um, in most instances. But some places will be allowing you to book and will be by limitation of number of people. And again, hotel gyms, you'll need to book your slot and there'll be a lot more cleaning going on. So in some respects, you know, I I will I will go and stay in a hotel because I'm absolutely fed up to the back teeth of booking three meals a day uh, or cooking three meals a day. Um, you know, I want to be looked after. Um, but you've got to you've got to weigh up. Is it is it the experience that you want or can you be patient and wait a bit longer? <laughs> so what other um, kind of solutions do you offer for for the corporate traveller. I mean, I know there's a lot of things in terms of, of safety. Is there anything yeah. that, you can, that you can tell us about on that side, but also potentially any future um, services with with the new landscape and with the, you know, with the global pandemic um, in mind and, and future possibilities of something like this happening again? Is that yeah. an area that you're going to look into? Yeah, absolutely. So a number of clients have come and said, you know, we're, we're interested in, um, you know, you can't say post pandemic travel because, you know, maybe COVID's going to be around for a long time. You know, not everybody's going to have access to a vaccine and, you know, we're going to have lots and lots of different, um, you know, second waves, et cetera. So I think we need we need to get used to traveling with COVID rather than post COVID. Um, and so we're absolutely researching behind the scenes to see what people want um, and what we can deliver in response to that. Because, um, you know, what was advice day two weeks ago? You know, we talk about, um, you know, it, 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 to board an A380 um, at two meter space would be a kilometer long queue. Um, which is a lot of standing, whereas if that drops down to one meter, it's a little bit more palatable. So it's also about keeping on top of um, what's the latest and the current advice, but absolutely um, by speaking to the hotels, the lounges, the airports, the um, airlines on a regular basis, then we are in a great position to be able to advise organizations on um, how to, to safeguard their, their travelers. And interestingly, whilst at the moment, of course, we're in a hiatus because people aren't traveling and they're slashing travel budgets because of that, um, I can only foresee that when people do start to travel again, the duty of care is actually going to be the top of people's minds because, you know, traveler well-being, uh, both physically and mentally, is going to be paramount because, that, right, as you said at the beginning, people are going to be nervous about traveling or they could be shielding family members or they could have an, an underlying health condition, or they might be anti uh, vaccines. So there's lots of reasons, and companies can't just prime to why somebody doesn't want to travel. You know, they've got to, you know, also be a little bit sensitive to that. So there's a whole piece around um, 
managing the managers as well and helping them uh, to be sensitive to their travellers' needs. And and also, after being in lockdown for three, four months, people might have a different view about how they want to live. You know, they may have been road warriors, but now actually they've spent time, they've reconnected with their families. They've woken up for the first time in years without an alarm clock. Maybe people just don't want to live that life anymore. Yeah, well, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because since um, the lockdown has eased a little bit, um, myself and Christian, who who were in business together for Nifty Communications, we've we've popped into into our local um, town where our office is. And over the last sort of few weeks, it's got busier and busier, obviously with the shops reopening, etc. And and it's strange because it is having having been having had such a clear and successful message with stay home, save lives. The, the sort of current messages have been mixed or people aren't really sure of, of where they are. Um, and I think that that initial message was so strong that people actually do feel quite nervous going out and about in their in their daily um daily lives really. So yeah. that will yeah. obviously come in through the travel industry as well. Um, you know, and even talking about cleanliness, you know, that is something that should really reassure us because that's something that hopefully will stay top priority whereas you know you do you have heard horror stories or even seen I think there was some sort of tv documentaries of how clean our hotel rooms really well now you know there is no excuse if they want to get customers back through the door they've got to be playing this right at the top of the game I mean my my sister would you know the first thing she does if she goes into a into a new place would be to inspect how clean is is the hotel um you know and anything that wasn't wasn't right you know she would not would not be comfortable staying there previously so let her know now so that's really really interesting yeah, I and think actually, you can't see COVID can you you know and things like the TV remote control you know, absolute walking germ piece of equipment there, you know, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's crazy, crazy to think about really, isn't it? Um, but we do need to to support the industries as well. You know, it's like with the with the sort of the latest reopenings that are going to happen on the 4th of July, with hopefully some some pubs and places getting opened up. Is it, is it a case, do you think, that people are just going to rush back or or tread softly softly it's a bit of a mixture isn't it definitely a mixture from the people that i've spoken to particularly the ones who are um really health conscious or have got health concerns or even health anxiety so they they've got ultimate control of their environment at home you know we actually haven't integrated with anybody i've done a couple of socially distant uh, walks with people with friends but apart from that, you know, I'm not going to the supermarket. I really have no desire to go and stand outside a shop for half an hour and, and go around a one way system. I'll just I'll just wait. And so to go from that entirely sanitary environment to suddenly an environment where you don't have control um, is it's quite a jump. And I think for me to go to a hotel, I'm pretty confident that particularly in the early days when people are nervous, low occupancy rates, People are really sort of like knocking it out of the park in terms of using all their new cleaning procedures will be a really safe experience. But in yeah, terms of yeah. me, you know, getting on a train, going to the airport, flying to another country, going through two lots of security, I've got no, 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 I can't say I don't have the desire because I'd love to do that tomorrow. But weighing all things up, for me, my health is more important. Yeah, yeah, I'm just a yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. I was going to ask you something about about that then, but just it's gone, it's gone. It'll come back to me. <laughs> so, whew, I'm so hot. I've got to say, I'm literally sweating in this room on the hottest day of the year. Um, <laughs> who, who needs to travel? <laughs> <laughs> So what um, what advice would you give to corporates, to companies at the moment that are are thinking about potentially opening up to even more travel within the UK? I think we've found such success with um, virtual calls and virtual yeah. meetings that anyway, um, they'll probably it will probably be significantly reduce the amount of travel that people 
need to do for for their work yeah. um and I think that that's the responsibility isn't it of of the business leaders to um, engage in conversation with their their teams and their staff as well to find out how comfortable or confident they feel um, and and to really sort of analyze is is this meeting this face to face meeting worth it do we need to do it for all sorts of reasons you know yeah. cost time um, you know how people are going to feel where a virtual meeting could could take place not that we want to only live in our virtual worlds we do want to see each other face to face but I do think there's going to be a massive change um, on that going forward absolutely yeah you, you have you've hit the nail on the head it is about you know we're going into an economic slump so anyway companies are scaling back on spend um so there's an economic reason to check if the trip is absolutely not, um, necessary um but also from a, an employee well-being perspective as well the next thing is to make sure that the destination that that person is traveling to is actually open for business. Can they get in? What are the quarantine restrictions? What's required? Making sure that employees are aware of that as well. Um, but then also um, looking at the providers that they're going to be using. So it may be that if they want to isolate their travelers more, that they may well be using hire cars or a one person, um, one passenger chauffeur drive company, as opposed to maybe previously they were using, um, you know, public transport, but also maybe thinking about choosing hotels closer to the office so there's less um, commute uh, time needed or, you know, fewer stages of the journey. That might, might mean that they're having to spend more on travel per person or per trip as well. Um, and then also, um, as I mentioned, not prying too much if someone's showing reticence to travel, then um, respecting that as well. Um, and, and keeping in touch with travellers a lot more, making sure that travellers know um, who to call should they get symptoms, what are the local medical facilities, um, if they potentially are going to need repatriation, um, you know, how they're going to access that. Um, so there's there's a lot actually that travel managers um, can really do now to shine and to and, and to you know to step way into the white the, the limelight really you know because they are really going to be at the forefront of um, you know moving their own businesses forward and keeping keeping people safe but also keeping the business moving as well particularly for like sales staff who really need that um, that face to face interaction. Mm. So many procedures and things that need to take place, aren't they? That we've just sort of well, we've, we've taken for granted, I guess, you know, pre pre COVID. That now, literally, every single thing has to be thought through, um, you know, to the to the like such detail. Um, you touched upon it then. You know, we we talked about it just before we went live. Actually, that one of the concerns people might have if they were to um, have to travel for for work reasons or or indeed at a point when holiday travel is is allowed again um what would happen if they were to be taken ill in another country that could be a fear for people and like you say what are the medical facilities that they have there um and do do you know anything about sort of the travel insurance at the moment i mean i mean, i must admit i'm out of the loop but how that would work in the, in this current situation yeah, so um, from a travel insurance perspective, a lot of that is focused on cancellation of trips. So this is really, I guess, of interest for people who are looking at holidays as well. Not every uh, policy will have, um, you know, a, a, a close where they say, or they will have a close maybe where acts of God or pandemics are excluded. But also if somebody's booked a trip and then they have a disinclination to travel, that's not a reason to claim on the insurance as well. So if you decide it's just not worth it and you decide not to go, rather than there's a technical reason why you can't go, then again, that might be a loophole that you get caught out with. Um, again, make sure that the travel in, um, insurance um, will cover the medical costs. And that's why it's really important that you're honest with your insurance company about any pre-existing conditions because if there are any loopholes then potentially you open yourself up to not having um your, your, yourself covered um, and people um misunderstood um quite um a lot in the first wave 
the uh, the guidance around repatriation and so a lot of people were calling their insurance company expecting them to get them out of somewhere um, and again that's not always going to be the case um, and what we saw is that embassies were overwhelmed um, and people were having to either stay stranded and we know people are still stranded and um, you know not everybody's got back to where they need to be um, so all those things you know they need to be uh, understood before we travel i mean how many of us travel on holiday or on business and we don't have our travel insurance policy details with us we just wing it don't we are we if we think we might need them might sort of run through our emails and try and find the renewal email but yeah get that all sorted and checked before you travel yeah i agree i often don't, don't know all those details and, and even like you know the finer um sort of small prints within your insurance of what's covered you just kind of think oh that it'll all be fine um whereas something like this has has really hit home for people yeah really not everything um you know we can't control everything can we no um, as much as we want to <laughs> yeah no and um you touched on it then but i know i've been surprised about the number of people that have have been um i don't know if stranded is the right word but yeah or, or stuck in in other countries and unable to get home at this time that's a another thing i haven't really considered but it has come up when um when i've gone to speak to people business contacts and somebody actually earlier in the week they said oh well yeah we really want to talk about that but we're actually still over in america um mm -hmm. getting it was actually to do with gardening so um this particular contact hadn't been back and been able to to get their gardening um business sort of up and running um at a time when it's at, it, at its peak as well <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you touched on it earlier as well that people might have um, reprioritized some of the things in their life, and that somebody that that might have been very used to traveling and, and being away from from home for a lot of the, the time of the week, etc., may have um, put other things on the top of the list like yoga, meditation, exercise, etc. <laughs> family yeah actually being there for for tea time and <laughs> all, and all the rest of it so there's quite a lot of um there's quite a lot of things that are going to continue to have an impact regardless of where we are now it's it's going to be interesting to see the landscape as it unfolds at the same time you know like you I've spoken to people that are absolutely desperate and if they could go on holiday tomorrow they would regardless so it's you know different different people you know react differently don't they so yeah there's no, there's no particular um answer it's just speculation but as to how things how things will will unfold what sort of time frame do you think for for things is it are we talking about into next year are we talking about when we've we've got more um knowledge about the antibody testing when we know if people can travel if they have already had covid if is it a case of waiting for vaccines is it all of these things still up in the air in terms of of the travel industry um yeah i think the travel industry is going to take a serious amount of time to recover if you look at all the layoffs you know from the airlines from swiss port today or yesterday i think and you know many many more companies sadly going under um, in terms of getting back to where we were, I'm not sure that we ever will, because you touched on it earlier, you know, some non-essential meetings or, you know, maybe companies who have a, a monthly team meeting at HQ, they'll probably go down to one a quarter, the rest be done by Zoom. We've heard chief execs talking about actually getting rid of their head officers. They don't they realise that they don't need those expensive officers anymore. So um, in terms of the speed and numbers, um, I don't think that we're going to see that for a number a number of years, actually. Um, you know, of course, there's going to be a lot of people traveling. It, it is going to it is going to get busy and it's going to get, you know, vibrant again. But absolutely, from my perspective, I just don't see the same numbers doing the same thing in the same way for probably five years. Yeah. yeah. What do you think for, for hotel industry, travel industry, the areas that you work in, what sort of what good has come out of this this situation, or what what can people take away that's been a, more of a positive impact? Because obviously it has been hit hard. Yeah, 
Um, it's well, I, I, I think I'm, I'm struggling with this one I, because actually a lot of people have been furloughed, so they've been out of the business as well. And then sadly, a lot of people who have been furloughed are now facing redundancies. Um, and so the only thing that, you know, I I can say is the strength and the passion of the people who are still, um, well, everybody's got the strength and the passion, but, you know, the, it's that, it, it, and it's actually really, really shone through that, you know, support for each other. If you look at what the Business um, Travel Association are doing to really lobby the government, they're getting a much bigger voice. They're pushing really hard for the reduction or the uh, removal of the, the quarantine, the 14 day quarantine. So I think that the travel industry um, has, on a, a, a macro level, got a lot more visibility and how that impacts our economy and how, how essential it is. Um, you know the strength of character of the people who fought to, to you know to try and get us through this. But in general, it's not a good news story for for the travel industry. Yeah, yeah. And another one just to touch on is actually, do you think that um, stronger measures weren't in place soon enough in terms of, of travel um, before Boris decided to sort of put the country in in the UK lockdown? No pressure there, Rachel. <laughs> um, well, interestingly, my partner uh, was skiing in Ischgl, um, unbeknown to him in, in Austria, um, that there was um, an outbreak. Um, and so he came on and he could have actually been carrying the germs and could have infected me. Luckily, he didn't. Yeah. Um, so people were travelling in hotspots um that obviously could have could have brought the virus back so um make of that what you will um they're also finding um cases of people who had it back in december in europe um so i, I don't think we can blame any one particular government um, i think the whole world was taken by surprise because actually in the beginning of uh, 2020 a lot of my clients are corporate security um, managers and they were saying, oh, I can't talk to you right now. I'm really busy. I'm sorting out. I've got travelers in China. Um, can we postpone for a month? Can we catch up in five weeks? And so I just thought, oh, this is, a, you know, this is inconvenient for me as a business because these people are sort of busy sorting out um, their travelers in China. I never imagined for a moment that, you know, three months hence, the impact that it would have on our lives but also, sadly, how many lives will have been lost. And, um, it, it, you know, I've got really high risk threshold, so I, I would say that I'm a risk taker. Um, but this actually, it caught me out this time, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We had no idea. No. I'm going to round up there. Thank you so much for your insights into um, the hotel industry, the travel industry, all of your supply chain and people that you that you talk to and work with. It's been really informative. Um, Thank you. Definitely, definitely for myself and and our audience. I'm really sorry about the technical issue that we had. That's um, all right. I think we spelled it out. But you're such a professional, as always, and carried on through. Um, I will say for anybody watching now or if you're watching later um, on the Not Live feed, do just still like, share and comment and we could come back to you if you've got any specific questions that Carolyn can answer for you. Um, and thank you very much for your time today, Carolyn. I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, of course I did. I just got to talk about my favourite thing, which is travel. So, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs>